today we're going to read chapter 8 in War Horse, and this chapter covers pages 58 through 62. It's a pretty short chapter, and we're going to talk about two different strategies today. The first strategy that we're going to follow along with and track as we read are character pressures for Joey. So I drew a little picture of Joey in the middle of my paper, and then as we come upon pressures that he's facing, I'll jot them down around his picture. Okay, chapter 8. For just a few short moments, we moved forward at the trot as we had done in training. So remember when we left off of chapter seven, they were, um, Cap Trooper Warren and Joey were headed into battle. In the eerie silence of no man's land, all that could be heard was the jingle of the harness and the snorting of the horses. We picked our way around the craters, keeping our line as best we could. Up ahead of us, at the top of a gentle sloping hill, were the battered remnants of a woods, and just below a hideous, rusting roll of barbed wire that stretched out along the horizon as far as the eye could see. Wire, I heard Trooper Warren whisper through his teeth. Oh, God, Joey. They said the wire would be gone. They said the guns would deal with the wire. Oh, my God. We were cantering now, and still there was no sound nor sight of any in enemy. The troopers were shouting at an invisible foe, leaning over their horses' necks, their sabers stretched out in front of them. I galvanized myself into a gallop to keep up with Topthorn. And as I did, so the first terrible shells fell among us and the machine guns opened up. All right, so a couple pressures that he's under already is that um, he's in battle. There's um, barbed wire. And the reason that that is such a bad thing is because you may not be able to see it and the horses could run into it. And when they do, it's going to uh, cut, cut their legs, um, their fetlocks, and they won't be able to run. It'll cause them a lot of pain. So they'll be injured. So they won't be able to perform um, like they would normally be able to perform. And now they're hearing um, machine guns. So all of these things, I'm sure, are causing Joey a lot of stress because he's right smack in the middle of battle. The bedlam of battle had begun. All around me, men cried and fell to the ground. And horses reared and screamed in an agony of fear and pain. The ground erupted on either side of me, throwing horses and riders clear into the air. The shells whined and roared overhead, and every explosion seemed like an earthquake to us, but the squadron galloped on inexorably through it all, toward the wire and at the top of the hill, and I went with them. All right, so still, he's seeing horses fall to the ground, And he's seeing uh, soldiers injured. On my back, Trooper Warren held me in an iron grip with his knees. I stumbled once and felt him loose a stirrup and slowed so that he could find it again. Topthorn was still ahead of me, his head up, his tail whisking from side to side. So another pressure he's under is he wants to keep up with Topthorn. That's kind of his security. I found more strength in my legs and I charged after him. Trooper Warren prayed aloud as he rode, but his prayer soon turned to curses as he saw the carnage around him. Only a few horses reached the wire and Topthorn and I were among them. There were indeed a few holes blasted through the wire by our bombardment so that some of us could find a way through and we came at last upon the first line of enemy trenches but they were empty. The firing came now from higher up and among the trees, and so the squadron, or what was left of it, regrouped and galloped up into the woods, only to be met by a line of hidden wire in among the trees. So he's like running for his life. So let me add that. Running for his life. 
Some of the horses ran into the wire before they could be stopped and stuck there, their riders trying feverishly to extract them. I saw one trooper dismount deliberately. Once he saw that his horse was caught, he pulled out his rifle and he shot his mount before falling dead on the wire, himself on the wire. I could see at once that there was no way through, that the only way was to jump the wire. And when I saw Top Thorn and Captain Stewart leap over where the wire was lowest, I followed them, and we found ourselves at last in among the enemy. From behind every tree from trenches all around, it seemed, they ran forward in their piked helmets to counteract. They rushed past us, ignoring us, until we found ourselves surrounded by an entire company of soldiers, their rifles pointing up at us. All right, so now he's being captured by the enemy at gunpoint. So he is a POW, which is a prisoner of war now to the Germans. The crop of the shelling and the splitting of rifle fire had suddenly stopped. I looked around me for the rest of the squadron to discover that we were alone. Behind us, the riderless horses all that was left of a proud cavalry squadron galloped back toward our trenches, and the hillside below was strewn with the dead and dying. So he's surrounded by dead, by death. Throw down your sword, trooper," said Captain Stewart, bending in his saddle and drooping, uh, dropping his sword to the ground. "There's been enough useless slaughter today. No sense in adding to it." He walked Topthorn closer toward us and reined up. And trooper. I told you once we had the best horses in the squadron, and today they showed us they are the best horses in the entire regiment and the whole confounded army, and there's not a scratch on them. He dismounted as the German shoulders closed, soldiers closed in, and Trooper Warren followed suit. They stood side by side, holding our reins while we were surrounded. We looked back down at the hill at the battlefield. A few horses were still struggling on the wire. But one by one, they were put out of their misery by the advancing German infantry, who had already regained their line of trenches. They were the last shots in the battle. What a waste, the captain said. What a ghastly waste. Maybe now, when they see, they'll say, see this, they'll understand that you can't send horses into wire and machine guns. Maybe now they'll think again. The soldiers around us seemed weary of us and kept their distance. They seemed not to know quite what to do with us. The horses, sir? Trooper Warren asked. Joey and Topthorn, what happens to them now? Same as us, Trooper, said Captain Stewart. They're prisoners of war just as we are. Flanked by the soldiers who hardly spoke, we were escorted over the brow of a hill and down into the valley below. Here, the valley was still green for there had been no battle over this ground as yet. All the while, Trooper Warren had his arm over my neck to reassure me, and I felt then that he was beginning to say goodbye. All right, so another pressure. Uh, he's saying goodbye to Trooper Warren, who had been a great friend. So it just seems like someone the other day pointed out that another motif that we could track would be abandonment or, um, you know, separation, and that's exactly right, because it seems like Joey bonds with someone, and then they're gone. He spoke softly into my ear. Don't suppose they'll let you come with me where I'm going, Joey. I wish they could, but they can't, but I shan't ever forget you. I promise you that. Don't you worry, Trooper Captain Stewart said. The Germans love their horses every bit as much as we do. They'll be all right. Anyway, Topthorn will look after you for Joey. You can be sure of that. As we came out of the woods and into the road below, we were halted by our escort. Captain Stewart and Trooper Warren were marched away down the road toward a cluster of ruined buildings that must at one time have been a village, while Topham and I were led away across the fields and farther down the valley. There was no time for farewells, long farewells, just a brief last stroke of the muzzle for each of us, and they were gone. As they walked away, Captain Stewart had his arm around Trooper Warren's shoulder. So... Friendship between Stuart and Warren, and friendship between Topthorn and Joey. Another thing that I want to talk to you about, um, as we're drawing closer to the time that you're about to start your personal narrative, 
Uh, and keep in mind that War Horse is a personal narrative. It's written by uh, from Joey's point of view. And the purpose in reading this book is to just show you how um, you put together thoughts and then how you plan to create a personal narrative. So um, one thing that I want to talk to you about today is a story map. And I'm going to have you create a story map. A story map can be just a little... Um, map say in consecutive order or chronological order of um, maybe when you were born different things that's happened through your life um, or it could be a map of maybe a trip like this is uh, when you left for your trip and what happened along your journey and what happened while you were on the trip and on your way home so um, a story map that could have been mapped out before war horse was written could have looked like this, like in chapter one, the author was planning that there would be an auction where Joey would be taken from his mom. Chapter two, um, it takes place on the farm and he meets Albert. Albert's kind, his dad is not, and he and Zoe become friends. In chapter three, the setting is still on the farm. The tension starts to rise and Albert and his dad are, are fighting a lot. And then in chapter four, you have the village. Uh, it's where it's taken place where Joey was sold and Albert um, tried to prevent him being sold. Chapter five, um, he went to riding school and he was trained for war and that's where he started to bond with Captain Nichols. In chapter six, this was on the ship when they were uh, riding over to the battlefield. And this is when he and Topthorn um, became friends and then they went to battle and this is where Captain Nichols was killed. And then in chapter seven, uh, it took place mainly on the battlefield and uh, he met a new rider, Trooper Warren. This was taking place near Switzerland, and he went into another battle. And then in chapter 8, uh, he was in a battle in no man's land where he was running through wire and through the middle of carnage, and then he was captured as a prisoner of war by German soldiers. So uh, what could happen before you write is that you could create a story map on an idea, um, something that you might want to write about. And it, it could look like something like this. It can be divided into like, you know, like chapters or events or um, like I mentioned a few seconds ago, this is like the beginning, the middle, the end of your story. And it can keep going. Like this map will continue to go on. Then I will add to chapter nine and then chapter 10 and then chapter 11 and so on all the way till we get to chapter 21. And then we can look back at this and we can say, okay, this story map could have been a plan that the author used to create War Horse. And then it can also be used as a plan to create a summary of what War Horse was actually about and to reflect on, on the whole personal narrative. So what you're gonna do today is you are going to create a notebook entry with uh, pressures that Joey might be under. And I'm giving you some ideas here. You're welcome to steal some of mine and add to with some things that you heard that I may not have written down. And then you're going to start a story map of events that have taken place in your life that you might choose to write about. Remember, all of these little um, lists that we've made or something like a story map is all to help you generate ideas for your personal narrative that we're going to be starting as early as probably next week. So um, go and have fun doing the work.